Okay, um, let's start. This is the fourth presentation of this webinar. Uh, the for this presentation will be will be made by Nuno Nunes. Nuno Nunes is a professor, a full professor of um, Instituto Superior Técnico in the <clears throat> Computer Science Department, and the talk is about passive Wi-Fi monitoring in the wild a long-term study across multiple location typologies. Nunu is yours, the okay. stage is yours. Uh, I'm going to try and share. I think there are people that don't speak Portuguese in the audience. Uh, no, I'm... but uh, it's, it's better you uh, talk in it's... English because it is uh, okay, okay, being okay. recorded. Okay. okay, perfect. Let me just see if I can share my screen. This is always a... <laughs> I have to share part of the screen because I'm using Safari. Yes. Can you see the, mm -hmm. the first yes. slide? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation, Milker and Serena. Um, I know that this is a, a seminar series on, on spatial data science, but I'm, I'm going to actually talk about the project that we've been developing uh, for a long time now, several years since 2017, uh, which is, has been the basis of several um, uh, master and PhD theses, uh, starting in Madeira and using a data set from Madeira. I'm not going to talk uh, on the technicalities of the of, of the methods we've used, because I think you are, you, you know much more about that than we do, but I'm going to try to introduce my vision of how uh, these uh, access to this data and, and in fact having a, a, a way to create a community-based infrastructure could leverage a new, uh, a new types of services that could be useful to the community, which I think is a more interesting and perhaps hopefully a more interesting aspect than, than talking about the methods we've used because the, the contributions are not there. Just briefly to say that uh, I'm, I'm from ITI, which is one of the research units that, that forms LARSIS, uh, which started in Madeira uh, uh, 12 years ago and, and then moved here to technical. We still have a poll there. And, uh, and also has a, a, a poll in, in the Fine Arts School of the University of Lisbon. So we, we are very interdisciplinary. And, and our focus is, is, is on human computer interaction. So this idea that once computing technology became good enough, which is something that happened probably around the turn of the century, when you know the computers were good enough and you were not looking when you're buying a computer or when you're trying to decide uh, what to use in terms of computing technology. And uh, what started becoming important and relevant is more marketing and design. So these, these two dimensions started having a bigger influence. And now the big trend that we fortunately anticipated several years ago by hiring a lot of people with backgrounds in design and, and some of them in art is this idea that if you want to explore the future of computing, uh, you should be looking at, uh, at uh, speculative design as a way to investigate how computing could, could be and what computing should be, uh, because you, you basically can do everything you want these days. This is one example from one of our colleagues, uh, James Auger, who, who actually now moved to, to Paris and is, is, is creating a design department at the Ecole in, in Paris, which is also an important trend, which you, you can see everywhere in most engineering and business schools, people are looking at design as, as, as a way to, to understand how the future could be. And this project is a very interesting project because they basically was using uh, sensing technologies to understand uh, within a family context, if people were uh, on the verge of having a fight, like if, if a couple was trying to fight or not. And so basically this, this system that you saw, uh, which rotates, um, changes the sync to express when um, a couple might start an argument or, or a family is going to start having an argument. So this idea that, you know, we can collect a lot of data using sensors, we can have a lot of, of these methods that uh, can be used to predict what, what's going to happen, but what should you do when you're trying to predict that? And so this is what brings me to the project. Uh, this was a, a research project that, like I said, it's already finished many years ago. 
uh, and the idea came from the uh, tourism board of Madeira Islands and the idea that they said, look, we, we want to understand how we could develop new media, new marketing tools to promote a more sustainable uh, tourism destination. It's a very interdisciplinary project uh, with, with several people that ended up you know, doing their PhDs and, and, and postdocs with us. It was actually, the, the PI was, was Valentina Nisi, who was also our colleague. And, uh, and, and as you know, you know, Madrid is a beautiful place, uh, amazing landscapes, uh, but what's happening uh, in many of these touristic destinations is that, you know, these beautiful images are suddenly turning something like this. And so, and, and I can tell you, I was just talking with Mario that I just came from Madeira and the, the pressures of tourism are becoming overwhelming in many places. Lisbon is another case of those, of those pressures. And, uh, and the idea was, can we uh, create uh, uh, an infrastructure that could provide information to all of the stakeholders in a touristic island like Madeira to avoid these crowded places? This is not, this is an actual fact, is that there are already queuing lines going up the Everest and people are dying because they are queuing to get there. So this is, this is how crazy it's, the situation is, 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 is right now. And, uh, and this is a recent cover of the regional newspaper uh, because with the end of the COVID pandemic and, uh, and the, the comeback of tourism, what you can see, and this is, this is last week, I think, uh, is that the people in the trails in Madeira are becoming so crowded that the, the touristic experience is becoming not what it should be. You know, you're not observing nature and having a good time uh, during your walk. You're basically queuing to get to a place that is completely crowded with tourists. So what we did uh, was to think, how could we develop uh, an infrastructure in Madeira Islands? Madeira is, is an interesting case study and still is an inter interesting case study for us because it's a relatively densely populated island. It's the, many people don't know, it's the third metropolitan area of Portugal after Lisbon and Porto. Now Braga might be getting there, but it's, it has around 270,000 inhabitants, 1.5 million tourists visiting the island. Uh, and, uh, but it's relatively small. And uh, what we did is we, we thought about what could we do uh, to try and measure the presence of people. And uh, we basically looked at the island, detected the, the most important points of interest in the island. We also did some, some in Porto Santo and, and even considering doing some in, in the other islands, which are natural reserve parks. Of course, we, we designed this, this uh, more densely in, in, the, in the urban uh, area of Funchal, the, the capital of, of Madeira Island. And back then, again, this was more than five years ago. What we did, we, we thought, could we use just simple Wi-Fi routers to detect the presence of people because everybody now is using devices like this. These devices are asking to connect to a Wi-Fi network. Can we actually use that information to detect if uh, people are present in a specific place? These devices are relatively cheap. So basically what I did with my PhD student, we went to uh, a shop, we bought some of these devices. Then let, later on, we found a, a smaller device, which is there on the right. And we just bought as much as we could. We hacked the, the, the operating system of these devices. And instead of, of acting as a router, they are basically listening to the probe requests that the network is, is doing when uh, our devices are trying to connect to the Wi-Fi. Initially, we, we actually, back then, uh, we were able to even detect the IDs of some of these devices and uh, as a disclosure for privacy and security right now, the protocols of the Wi-Fi devices do not disclose any, any ID, they randomize the ID of the devices, so it's virtually impossible to track someone using this technology, but it is possible to detect how many people can we estimate to be within the range of, of one of these routers. And so basically what happened is that, you know, after buying a lot of these things, I think the person in, in the shop thought we were a little bit crazy because we bought as many as we could. Uh, we had a little bit of funding. Then we ordered the smaller ones. Uh, uh, the next step, you know, we, we did the lab tests. We, we basically rewrote the code of the router to, to collect the, the probe requests. So these requests that the devices make when they are trying to connect to a Wi-Fi network, even on standby, 
your phone, if it has Wi-Fi active, is always doing that. Uh, this is exactly the same technology that Google uses to improve, for instance, location uh, uh, through GPS, because in many uh, places, especially in big cities with big uh, the buildings, it's very hard to, to, to have a good accuracy using GPS. So basically, triangulation using the, the, the signal strength of Wi-Fi networks is a very well-known a technique used in mobile devices to improve location. Uh, by the way, for those of you who don't know, the famous Google cars that take the street view images, uh, they are also collecting exactly the, 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 the signal strength of all of the available Wi-Fi networks. And by collecting that data and connecting that data with um, the specific location of the device, we can improve location uh, accuracy in, in, in many urban applications. So basically what we did is we got these devices, we made them work. Uh, I, again, I don't want to go into the, into the details of this, but you can imagine that not, all, not everybody has a device. Many people might have multiple devices. Not all devices can be captured, especially if you have one of these routers in a specific a place because it might be out of range or you might be moving in a car and there is not enough time for the device to send uh, the, the probe request. And so what we were trying to do is, can we use uh, techniques? In this case, you have a, an example using random forest regression. Can we take the information that is captured by these devices and can we correlate this information with the number of people in a specific place where we put the router? And the answer is yes, we can do that. It's relatively easy to do it. Uh, and we can use that information to um, estimate the number of people in a specific place, whether it's a, a square, uh, like I was showing in the, in the graph, it could be a square where you have a lot of people, uh, or it could be a street where you have people passing by, or it could be you know, a Levada walk or a monument or, or a, a sightseeing place. Uh, we tested um, uh, our algorithms in these specific locations. And again, the challenge here is that we are doing testing in the wild. So we actually had to collect ground truth data, which is not easy. Uh, this one here is in a beach club in Madeira. Uh, so we basically correlated the information that our device was collecting with the information of the uh, counting of people that were there during a period of time. And so that was, in a nutshell, the, the, the project um, which we did. Uh, it had many other dimensions, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them. But again, our goal was not to do sensing for the sake of doing sensing, was actually not to make major contributions in terms of data science methods to, to collect, to estimate, and, and even to forecast the presence of people based on passive Wi-Fi uh, signals, but was to create this uh, infrastructure that could be uh, created and designed by a um, community and serve the community. And our purpose here is a lot of these data is available by uh, you know, telecom operators. It is available, Google has a lot of this data using exactly the same devices that, but this data is proprietary. So I cannot use it to create new uh, services or if I can use it to create new services, basically what happens is that uh, uh, I have to pay for that information and that it's not under the control of the authorities. And like I usually say to my students, uh, Google, Uber, all of these big tech companies know more about the cities where we live than the actual city uh, uh, council of, of, of the city of Lisbon or whatever city or the government. So the authorities, the, the people that generate the data, they don't have access for the data. And the idea was, can we create visualizations and, and on top of those uh, actual uh, services that could be used to empower the community to solve some of the problems. So some of the problems could be, you know, uh, how many people did go to watch the flower festival in the day? Uh, if, you know, if I uh, do a specific festival, how many people actually were attracted by that? And how does that change the tourism dynamics of, of, the, of, the, of the city or, 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 the, or, or of the overall island? So this is a, a system that is actually running. 
uh, even though we didn't, uh, we don't have the 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 full network working right now because the cost is is maintaining the infrastructure. But it's actually working, and and it was being used and repurposed several times to detect the 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 flows of tourism in in Madeira Islands. So this is how the actual system looks like. Um, we did some other experiments. So although I cannot track people. I can sense how an effect of movement can happen through space by, for instance, when a cruise ship gets to the island, uh, a lot of people get out of the cruise ship and you can see the effect of, of these people happening there. We also did some experiments uh, correlating the information from these routers, what we call the heart sensing component with what we call the soft sensing component. Uh, and we, we were able to see a pattern. So here you see Cap Girão is a very famous hotspot in Madeira Islands. You can see the times of the day where people tend to crowd in, in Cap Girão. And you could use this information to decide if I don't like to have a lot of people when I'm going sightseeing a place, I could choose to go uh, in a moment where there is not a lot of people. So again, this is a public uh, system. Uh, I can give you the URL. You can go there and try it. And and it's 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 powered by this community-based infrastructure. When I say community-based, I really mean it. So the only way we were able to make it work was by asking. So a guy who has a bar in the you know in in Cap Girão, that's where the, the router is is connected. And in return, what we told him is that you can have access to the data. And so basically these people were installing the devices, some you know, disconnected the devices because they said the information of how many people come here to my restaurant is something that I don't want to disclose. And we said, fine, if you don't want, just give back the equipment and we will install it somewhere else. So it was a very interesting community perspective that we have been using to uh, experiment and from a computer, uh, a human computer interaction and, uh, or a human data interaction perspective. So one of the examples actually from a student from Technic was, could we use this information to show to people the impact of tourism in CO2 emissions in the island? So basically what we did is we collected data from the airports, from the ports. We have every time a, a plane arrives, every time a boat arrives, we had the information about actually the weather, how is the weather, uh, uh, and we had information from the routers, which is actually represented there by these dots. Can we see the dynamics based on all of this data that we could collect? And again, this is public data. This is, again, another public website we have. I think it's still working. Uh, uh, this is one of the best students I had. This was an undergrad student here in technical and computer science. He did this uh, visualization. He was a third year student. Unfortunately, he just got a job, didn't even go to the master. It was a very interesting project. So you could look at this information and you could see, uh, and, and what we did is we talked to people to understand what was happening uh, there. So again, probably you were expecting someone to talk about a lot of the algorithms. Again, what we do is not that, is, is what can we do with this information? How can we make this information and give it back to the people and how do people react to all of this data. Uh, another example was COVID. So uh, as you know, there was a lockdown. I was here living in Lisbon. We decided to go back to Madeira and, and have a, a better place to be <laughs> under the lockdown. And then, you know, suddenly I thought, why don't we use this to give information to the authorities and to the population about which places are crowded? Because people didn't want, they were afraid to go to the supermarket if it was too crowded. And so that was part of, and again, repurposing the repurposing the the infrastructure to give information about people. And here, the challenge was: can we automatically detect what is the what, what does it mean a place is busy or a place is safe? Can we detect the threshold where the number of people, let's say, here in technical, is what I consider safe? Uh, which is not easy to do because it depends. I mean, if you're inside a classroom with no windows, you might consider that uh, X number of people is safe. Uh, we actually recreated this project also here in, in technical using the existing Wi-Fi infrastructure. Uh, and, and again, the idea is that why not using this infrastructure to provide the data back to people? By the way, Google, after that, 
also did a similar a similar project where you could see in Google Maps if a place was busy or not. Uh, another thing that we've done with colleagues from UCL was to augment the data sets. Uh, and again, I'm sorry if I'm going through too many uh, small projects, but I just wanted to give you an overview and a perspective of, of the type of research that we do and perhaps you know, start some kind of collaboration. So another aspect that we wanted to do is to augment the information that we collected using the sensor. So we designed this kind of robot-like, it, it's just a PC, it shows the data, but it's a physical interaction device, so you can punch these buttons and you can say things. Um, and you can ask questions to people. For instance, is this place busy? Do you think this place is busy? And, uh, and this device, which we deployed in, in the tourism center in, in Madeira, uh, was a, a, a technique that we used to create what we call a hybrid data set. What is a hybrid data set? A hybrid data set is a data set where you have the heart sensing data, so the number of people that we estimate are in a specific location, and the opinions of people that were there during that moment. So is this, I could imagine doing this, for instance, here in Almir and Reis, instead of you know, having all of these political discussions over the news, why don't you just install devices like this and ask people what they think? Do they think it's a good idea to have a cycling line in Almir and Reis or not? Do, you, do they really think that that place is busy. I actually end up living in, in Almiran Trej, so I'm very sensitive to this. Uh, but as you can imagine, I don't think it will be easy to get uh, something like this uh, happening there. But the idea that we could use the technology to add uh, qualitative data to the quantitative data, which is much easier to, to, to collect. So we did a lot of experiments about this, asking people, why do you think the, this specific Cap Girão is busy at this time. And they would say, okay, because the tourism, uh, the tours, the organized tours always come at the same time. Uh, and so we use this data to, to augment the, the existing data sets that we have. Uh, and again, sorry, this is a little bit out of place. Uh, another thing we did was we gave the opportunity to, um, the, this is actually the beach club I was showing. I'm sorry, the slides are out of place. This is the beach club I was telling you about in Funchal. And we basically gave the opportunity of the entities that uh, you know, have the responsibility for these places to put a widget showing the occupancy of, the, of that place. And it was interesting to see people you know, talking about it. And we asked questions. Do you find this place interesting? Do you find the, that this place is COVID safe? Do you find that the information we are providing is accurate? Do you find information to be trustworthy? And, and this for us is, is, is an interesting side of, of the research to understand how people interact with the data that we provide to them. Uh, do you think that this information violates your privacy? Do you think that this, some people got scared? You know, how, are you, how do you know how many people are here? And so asking questions to people for us is a very important component of our, of our research. And so, this ended up you know, generating a, an app called uh, Madeira Safe to Discover, where we were actually giving people an app that was installed by more than 20,000 people in the island, and where we were also asking the same type of information. And we even designed a gamification model, uh, which was used for a, for a, uh, a small period of time, uh, where we, give, we would give points to tourists if they were going to the places uh, that uh, were not crowded. So if I went to you know, the botanical garden in a less crowded moment, I would get points. I could use these points to get discounts in having access to a different, uh, to a different um, uh, place in the island. So in general terms, what we did was we developed this infrastructure uh, and we provided information back to, to the citizens. And uh, in that, we generated a lot of, of, of interesting publication, not necessarily on the data science methods, but more about how people uh, interact uh, with data. Uh, the technique itself, passive Wi-Fi, is, is quite good. Uh, uh, I find it's cheap because you can basically buy these devices and it's cheap. Uh, it can be deployed. So, of course, hard to maintain. These devices, sometimes they stop. Uh, sometimes someone takes them out and it, it's hard to do it. So it will be very challenging to do. Uh, it has another interesting feature, and that's the last story before I finish, I know I'm over time, which is the fact that 
uh, it has differential privacy embedded, meaning it's not 100% accurate, which is good because this is the way that you can pro pro you know, protect privacy of the, of the, of the people that are, are being used. Actually, and this is again going back to the engineering dilemma, uh, in the COVID project that actually uh, Maria Juan was also, uh, we collaborated also with other groups. Um, there was an interesting discussion among our, our research group because we had people interested in doing differential privacy. And so we had a data set that was inherently uh, and randomly was giving uh, not very accurate results every now and then. And so we had a data science team trying to correct the problem. And then we had another team uh, from another colleague here in technical trying to implement differential privacy on top of the uh, machine learning model was, that was trying to correct the data. And so many times we just you know, do these things because we are engineers and we like doing them. But uh, the original data set uh, had that, that information built in. So it was not 100% correct, but we felt that that was actually something that people uh, uh, understood and they, they felt it was a, a good feature of the system. Uh, uh, and that's it. That's what I wanted to, to present to you. And, and, and I'm happy to take some questions uh, and, and also to answer some of the technicalities if you, if you feel it, that's, that's, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nuno. No. Very interesting and nice presentation. Time for some questions. You have some questions? <clears throat> I have a, a simple question. Thanks, Nuno. No. It's interesting, interesting work. So concerning the privacy, have you thought of allowing mm -hmm. people to opt in to be tracked? To, to be tracked if... uh, the thing is that they cannot, so they, first, you cannot track someone with this. You okay. could potentially... You not even or you designed it not to do it? It is by design, these new devices. Um, and an interesting story about this project. When we started, the protocols for Wi-Fi in these devices, they were not yet prepared to protect your privacy. So they were still sending the MAC address, you know, you, yeah. you, you are the, probably the expert here. Uh, what we noticed is that the first place where we saw an increasing number of random MAC addresses was the golf course in Madre Islands. And I was a little bit, you know, why, is, why in that specific place you suddenly start seeing a lot of random devices because people have money yeah, and they buy the new models. Right now we have 99% of the probe requests are random devices. So to answer your question, yes, you could track someone who has an old phone probably, or that didn't update the, the software, but right now nobody can trace you using probe, uh, Wi-Fi probing. Uh, and so we cannot trace. What we can trace is the movement of people. So we can, like I was giving the example of the cruise ship, people arrive, you see a lot of people getting out of the boat and you see where this kind of mass of people goes. And, and, it, and, it, and the patterns are very clear. They go where the tourism operators want them to go. Yeah. So they don't spread uh, in the city. Yeah, they're shepherds. Yeah. No, no, can I ask you when... Uh, maybe it's not the issue in Madeira, of course, but uh, for example, in Lisbon, um, uh, in Lisbon, in particular in summer, one big issue here, if you apply this, this kind of tools here, is uh, uh, some, something could be very interesting is to link to some hair quality cover aids and health cover aids, just to manage the streets to interrupt circulation and so on it's it's, it's easy to implement discovery it's in the in this system right yeah uh, so we did two things uh, we didn't uh, in another project we, we tried to explore this data versus covid data so that's that's the project where we worked with uh, with maria joan and with uh, also with erlindo uh, another thing we did was to in some of these routers, we installed different types of sensors, like you know, uh, CO2, uh, NO2, uh, you know, temperature. These things are, are relatively cheap, uh, and and we try to sell the idea to the to the city hall. You know, you could have a, a, a you know a, 
citizen science project here going on and people that feel that uh, uh, you know the air quality in their city is not good enough they could ask to install a, a system like this and we could correlate the information uh, we found out that it's very sensitive not not for the people but for the authorities uh, i actually i would suggest that you try to look where are the air quality sensors in the city of lisbon placed you might be surprised where they put these sensors. Uh, I was very surprised in Funchal because I grew up there and I can tell you the places where these sensors are, are placed are not <laughs> places that you, you would believe they should. So I think that's another interesting aspect of, of this research that we will be very happy to accommodate. Good, good. good. Any other question? Any more question? Hi, no, no. Uh, well, I'm. I didn't, I, I already knew about this one, uh, the first project, but uh, the, the, the last one that you talked uh, about, do we need to keep talking in English or can we? No, in English, please, in English. <laughs> okay, uh, so the, 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 the other project that you are doing, which is very interesting, which is that one where people introduce you, when you interact with people, that mm -hmm. part, uh, 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 I didn't know it was new for me, and I, uh, I'm curious about that because I always have. I think it's a very good idea to ask people um, their opinion and what they 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 express their 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 opinion about uh, anything. It's it's very useful information. But the problem is that in this kind of uh, survey. Um, the, the 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 sample is biased because only people that interact will will answer the question mm -hmm. so this is a big challenge how do you to have how do you deal with that yeah but for instance uh, part of this research is happens in a lot of uh, a place i mean all of us i think went to the airport and saw the smiley face when you how was the service here so that's part of the commercial implementation of this type of research um, the group we, with whom we worked at uh, UCL, they did this in the, in the Olympic Park in London. And so one way to solve that problem uh, is to create this kind of uh, uh, playful interaction. So that's why we built the robot. It's not a robot, but we created something that will be appealing for people. They, they will walk in, not because they are cold, but because they are curious about what's happening there and then they start using it. Yeah, S said that, you know, uh, I, I never thought about that problem. Yeah, it, what is the bias here? I, I'm sure there is a bias, the same way there is a bias if you if you do some kind of pooling uh, yes, using other methods. Um, but uh, what we felt is that by using this kind of playful and and uh, and tangible interaction versus you know a tablet which is what we used in the second example in in the in madeira is much more interesting you collect much more data uh because it's part of a of an almost an engaging experience there so people are curious they were looking well is this a robot or not a robot and by the time they figure they understand it's not a robot they already answered it start question. punching it start yeah. punching <laughs> randomly <laughs> no no okay okay thank you Okay, folks. Any other question? I have a, another one. So, yes. so I guess this technology gives you a very cheap but accurate way of estimating how many people there are in the place. Yes. But uh, what about who are the people around in the place? Knowing if they are young or old, or uh, knowing some basic characteristics of the type of people that you get there. So. You mentioned this more active data collection methodology to enrich the data, but that only gives you a small sample, I imagine. So any ideas about how to go from, well, the small sample for which you have detailed data into the larger population? We did some experiments. Great question, Bruno. We did some experiments uh, because we had a lot of data in the beginning, mostly in the beginning. So let me give you, and, and part of this area is called uh, profiling. So can you profile the people using this type of information? You can, it's a little bit creepy, but you can. So let me give you one example of what can be done. We didn't explore a lot of that because we felt it was on, on the edge of what, what could be done with this type of information. So what you can, when your device um, 
is trying to connect to a Wi-Fi network, it usually sends the name of the, I'm simplifying things, but it's, it basically sends the name of the network. So let's say if two people, my wife is also a professor here, so we share our Wi-Fi name at home and the Wi-Fi of Edurom or technical here. Mm -hmm. So you could, in a way, understand if two people are connected because they will be sharing the names of the networks and they will be very similar. So mm -hmm. that's one type of information we, we were able to collect. Another type of information is that there is a public database of the coordinates of these Wi-Fi networks. Uh, you know, some of them might have Edurom, it's hard because it's, it's everywhere, but some are, have specific names. So can we, we were able to detect more or less the nationality of the person based on the Wi-Fi, the names of the Wi-Fi networks that the device was broadcasting. Because we know that you know this device sends three or four uh, network names that are in Germany. So this guy probably is German. What happens if you that, don't know the MAC address, you have this information? Devices. Yes. Okay, wow. Yes. Uh, for instance, we know how many devices of a specific vendor. We, we can know if the device is an Apple device, if it's an Android mm -hmm. device, if it's a Huawei or whatever. So the, there's a lot of interesting stuff that can be done and which is actually scary mm -hmm. because it shows how much, uh, you know, the, the likes of Google and, 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 and Apple can do with all of this information. Mm -hmm. But we didn't explore very much that, that, that side of things. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Hi. Yes, I have one question. Um, when we are doing this well, when you use this information, this uh, I know you cannot track people in a continuous way, mm -hmm. but you can track them at the Wi-Fi counting point. So when they are stations, you can identify that the, the same person was there at different times. No. No. Okay, so it yeah, you cannot do that. No, the, the MAC address, that ID, is randomized every okay. X minutes. So after, a, uh, and we did a lot of analysis of this to see if this could be broken and it's not. Another important aspect is that uh, each vendor implements this randomization in a different way and they don't disclose this information. It's not part of the protocol. As far as I know, the last time I checked, it's not part of the protocol. I don't know if with Wi-Fi 6, this has changed. Uh, but Wi-Fi, I mean, if you look at your device, I have a, um, an, an iPhone. I don't know if you can see it, but the, you can turn off Wi-Fi just not completely because they need this information for location services. So this information is, very, is still very, very important for many of the services you have on, on these devices. Uh, and so I, I'm not completely sure this is, and again, I've never done that type of research, but I'm sure that if you try hard enough, you might be able to do more things than, than we actually attempted. Yeah, okay. So in fact, you could try them to find profilings in terms of where people have been, if they follow the same tracks, if they have been in the same places or... It's, yeah. it's, it's an interesting, I think it's more important to think about you know, if we with just a few routers could collect this information, can you imagine how much? Absolutely. It would be? Absolutely. <laughs> it's scary. Yeah. Okay. I have another question. This is probably much more simple. Um, there are there were already uh, gadgets to count people. For instance, in airports, when you want to know what are the um, the the the, the, are, the times with more people when you have jams people uh, getting more to the airport. What is the advantage of using these um, Wi-Fi counters mm -hmm. um, comparing to the old systems of just counting people that pass in a gate or? or... Yeah, it's cost mostly. It's, it's very, very low cost. Uh, the challenge that we have, uh, and actually, by the way, now the government of Madeira is actually uh, opening a public procurement uh, to solve the problem of these levados to count the people and they are not going to use our system they are going probably to buy this from a telecom operator 
Um, so our solution is, 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 is cheap. Um, what we found as a challenge, uh, because my student had the idea of creating a company, he actually even tried to create a company to do this, is that many of, so we did this in buses, for instance, to count the number of people that enter a bus, and it worked quite well, uh, with the exception when the bus stopped, the, the people on the bus stop, you know, kind of messed everything around, but we, we could, uh, we could we could do it relatively well and uh, and and we found that this information was very important because for instance if you look at the bus it's easy to count how many people get in because they usually have to do some kind of ticket you can but you never know when they get out and so this is what our system was providing the challenge in a commercial uh, commercial scenario is that everybody mostly because we were dealing with engineers transport engineers you know people that is that they said this is not 100 percent accurate so i cannot rely on this data uh, which i found a little bit stupid in my opinion because in it you don't have anything and now you have a very good estimate but you don't adopt the solution because it's not 100 percent accurate uh, but so that was more or less the problem we faced with commercial applications of this and it's true it's not 100 percent that's part yeah, of but the, the benefits are, are clear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's thank again Nuno for this uh, for the interesting presentation of quite amazing topic. Um, and uh, just let me recall you that the next presentation, last one, will be given in uh, next Wednesday. Will be given by Mario Figueiredo. Quite challenging topic. Back to the basics. And uh, I hope you will be there. Thank you all and uh, keep safe. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noah, again. Bye.